to D-Flow. Hey, what's up guys? It's Dr. D-Flow back with my third upgrade video for the CNC mill, which was made possible by Automation Direct, a North American supplier of everything CNC, which is a natural pairing with this channel. A lot of the designs that I'm machining on this mill call for at least a couple threaded holes for bolting components together. This fixture plate I made in the first CNC mill upgrade video has 64 M5 holes, which would have taken a while to tap by hand. Creating internal threads can be automated by a CNC mill through one of three ways. Rigid tapping, tension compression tapping, or thread milling. To understand how these three techniques work, you have to be familiar with the helical form of a thread. Rotating a bolt in a threaded hole converts the rotational motion of the bolt head into linear motion as the bolt is pulled into the hole. Spin the bolt enough and you will tighten it against the surface. Much like this bolt example, the helical angle of a tap will cause this cutting tool to pull itself into a hole at a rate proportional to its rotation. When tapping by hand, you basically just let the tap pull itself straight down into the hole and you're left with usable threads. If I throw this tap into my CNC mill, we're gonna have a problem because the mill can easily resist that natural downward pull, and instead of a nice helical thread, we'll just have a larger hole. The solution is synchronous feed tapping, which is more commonly known as rigid tapping. With this technique, you synchronize the rotation of the spindle with the feed rate of the Z-axis to ensure the rotation of the tap matches the rate at which it should be plunging into the material. Rigid tapping is an extremely fast way to produce threaded holes, and the goal of this video is to enable rigid tapping on my mill by upgrading the spindle motor and attaching an encoder to the spindle to synchronize its rotation with the feed rate of this machine. However, before we start that upgrade, I wanna point out that the last two ways of creating internal threads on a CNC mill, tension compression tapping and thread milling, do not require spindle synchronization and can be performed on my mill in its current configuration. Tension compression tapping uses a special tool holder that soaks up any discrepancy between the actual feed rate of the mill and the RPM that the spindle is turning. This holder allows the tap to self-moderate the rate at which it pulls itself into the material. The only real problem with this method is that these bulky tool holders take up a lot of your Z-axis clearance and are costly. Thread milling, on the other hand, doesn't require a special holder or spindle synchronization. Thread milling is very much in a category of its own, and I won't be able to cover all the details. But briefly, this technique relies on a tool that is aptly named the thread mill. The thread mill is moved in a helical path by the X, Y, and Z motors of the mill. The exact spindle RPM is not important as long as it's high enough that the thread mill can cut through the material. Over the past couple of months, I've been playing around with thread milling and man, can you make some clean threads. With one tool, you can make a range of thread sizes and pitches and you can adjust how tight or loose the bolt will fit. For all the benefits of thread milling, it is a slower technique and does require more tweaking of the cutting parameters before you obtain that perfect thread. My rigid tapping upgrade won't inhibit me from thread milling in the future because as much as people like to argue about which technique is better, both thread cutting methods have their places. We'll keep discussing this throughout the upgrade, but let's get started. The first change that we need to make is that the stock motor needs to go. I've been very happy with my choice of going with a belt driven spindle versus the more common gearbox setup. With the belt, I'm able to get some high speeds for cutting aluminum and you can't hear the mill running on the other side of the garage door, which keeps my very close neighbors happy. However, the problem with belt driven spindles is that they have very little torque at low RPM due to induction motors like this one having a torque curve that favors higher RPM. Rigid tapping occurs at low spindle speeds to ensure that the Z axis can keep up 
and the amount of force required to turn a tap is surprisingly high. Tapping aluminum with an M5 tap requires 0.3 newton meters of torque, while an M10 tap requires 2.3 newton meters. The M10 tap is twice as big, but requires seven and a half times more torque. In addition to low torque, this stock motor is cooled by a fan at the top of the motor, which is tied to the shaft. The faster the motor spins, the more cooling the motor receives. So at low RPMs, there's a chance the motor could overheat and melt the insulation. Suffice to say, I need to switch out this general duty motor for an inverter or vector duty motor that is capable of constant torque operation from zero RPM to the base speed of the motor, which is typically 1800 to 3000 RPM. When it comes to motors, bigger is always better, but the main limitation that I have is the space between the power drawbar and the column. If I purchase a motor too big, then I'm going to have to make some major modifications. So for simplicity, I decided to look in the two horsepower range, which is the same as my stock motor. To pick out the motor, I went to the motor section of the Automation Direct website, clicked on Inverter Duty Motors, selected two horsepower and 230 volts, because that's near the max voltage of my garage. I ultimately landed on the Marathon Black Max Y551 motor. Based on the readily accessible drawings, it looked like I would be able to squeeze the motor between the drawbar and the column. The motor arrived looking like a rocket ship and it's a beast weighing in at 32 kilograms, which is almost twice the weight of the stock motor. Let's go ahead and get that stock motor off the mill so we can make some more comparisons. I'm gonna go ahead and take the power drawbar off just so I'm not bumping into it when I remove the motor. So the extra weight of this motor is due to its cast iron construction. Compared to the rolled steel housing of the stock motor, the cast iron enclosure with integrated fins has five times the thermal conductivity, meaning that no fan is needed to keep the insulation cool. So we don't have to worry about the motor overheating at low speeds. But due to the extra weight, I will have to retune the Z-axis motor, check out the servo motor upgrade video to see how that's accomplished. The new motor, has a NEMA frame, while the old one has a metric one. I was hoping that I was going to be able to drill some wider set holes in the mounting plate, but the new hole pattern overlapped with these side pieces of the mount. So I decided to build my own motor mount, which was a necessary evil, not only to mount the new motor, but this also gave me more flexibility with the belt lengths, as you will see later on. So the original motor mount is a cast part and for me to make this on the mill, I would require a seriously thick piece of steel or aluminum. And with today's prices of material, you know, I can't afford that. So we're gonna break this down into three sections. We're gonna have the mounting plate, the two sides, as well as these feet, which have these slots in them that allows you to tension the belt by moving uh, the motor back and forth. Now, unfortunately for me to make the motor mount for this guy, I need to go ahead and throw the old motor back on and turn out that part. This motor mount plate turned out great. I'm super excited with how I've been able to tune those feeds and speeds to get these nice surface finishes. I've also really embraced the mill drill tool for knocking off uh, sharp edges with a nice chamfer. It just makes the parts look more professional and they're obviously safer to handle. <laughs> 
for the side pieces of the motor mount, I needed them to be the exact same height so that the motor doesn't sit tilted. I took a shortcut by using a long piece of aluminum, facing it on all four sides to the correct dimensions, cutting it in half, and then drilling and thread milling some M8 bolts in it. This actually turned out really nicely. Thread milling is a slow process, not only because you have to interpolate the helix in all three dimensions, but also because the thread mill is prone to deflection because the neck of the tool has to be small for clearance. I always program a spring pass, which is an extra zero cut to account for any deflection that may have occurred during the cutting process. The two feet will have slots cut into them so that I can adjust the distance of the motor from the spindle. Now this is really important because closed loop belts only come in certain sizes and the bigger the slots I have in the feet, the more adjustability that I will have. Just a quick tip for those who are new to milling. I recommend buying your stock about six millimeters or a quarter inch taller than your part so that you can machine the top and sides in one operation and cut off that excess material on the backside in a second op. This makes 2.5D parts, which don't have any complex 3D curves, very easy to machine. Now that we have all five pieces cut out, let's head over to my bench, put them together. We'll make sure it fits on the motor. and It'll be good to go. The mounting plate and the feet connect to the sides by four M8 bolts each. that thread so easily. Before we throw this motor up on the spindle head, we need to talk about the pulleys and closed loop belt. But first, let me go grab the spindle pulley off the mill. The pulley is held down by this nut. It's a left-handed nut, so it's the good old righty-loosey. Pulley is held on by some set screws. I was able to pull that spindle pulley off with just my hands, but the spindle motor was being more difficult. I had to use a gear puller and I did not have the right size, so I had to grip the bottom flange of the pulley, which was not strong enough to withstand those forces and was a little bent out of shape after I was done with it. My original plan was to bore out the stock pulley to get it to fit the new motor shaft. But what I didn't realize is that this new shaft is slightly smaller. So this isn't gonna work. I then thought to myself that if I'm going to buy a new pulley, then I might as well try out a one-to-one -one gear ratio to get some higher speeds for churning through aluminum. But then I found myself in a weird spot. With the five millimeter pitch on this HTD belting, I couldn't find a large enough pulley with a bore small enough to fit on the motor shaft, and the spindle requires a 40 millimeter bore, so I couldn't use a smaller pulley there. The point here is that picking out pulleys and closed loop belting can be a little bit of a headache. Ultimately, I wanted to start fresh, so I picked up two of these 36 tooth, eight millimeter pitch pulleys for use with belts with curved teeth. 
like Gates HTD or GT belts. These pulleys are not designed to sit directly on the motor shaft, but instead they accept a special bushing that has an eight degree taper on its outside wall. These are known as taper lock bushings and when seated into the pulley, they will clamp tightly around the shaft. Combine this clamping action with a key and you don't have to use set screws that will mar up the shaft. This taper lock system is really nice because if I switch to a motor with a different size shaft, then I only need to get a new bushing and not a new pulley. The other thing I like about these pulleys is that you don't have to use a gear puller to get the pulley off. To remove the pulley, you just have to unseat the bushing by removing the screws and then using one of them uh, to insert into the third hole, which will actually cause the bushing and the pulley to separate when that screw is tightened down. The convenience and flexibility of this taper lock system comes at a price though, about $150 for the bushing and pulley, and you have to times that by two for both the spindle and for the motor. Unfortunately, the cost is not in there. When it comes to the size of a shaft key, there is a standard that is based on the diameter of the shaft. For a 40 millimeter shaft, such as my spindle, the key should be 12 millimeters wide and eight millimeters tall. This is why the keyway in the taper lock bushing for the spindle is 12 millimeters wide. Unfortunately, the key on the spindle shaft is six millimeters wide. I had to bring the bushing to the local machine shop where they added a smaller keyway. Now, if you will let me hop on my soapbox really quickly, then I would like to answer the age old question, is converting a manual mill to CNC cheaper than buying a turnkey system like a Tormach? When you perform the bare minimum changes, such as switching out the lead screws for ball screws and adding motors for the CNC motion, then there are some serious cost savings to be had. But when you start to go after some of the more advanced features, such as rigid tapping, then that value starts to evaporate. Designing around the weird corks of these import mills can be expensive when you don't have a full-fledged machine shop. Maybe if I had a key setter at my house, I'd be singing a different tune. The other problem is that when you remove components from your mill, like my stock motor, there is little resale value for these components because they are so cheap and odd. Who is going to buy a second-hand motor that they can't validate the specifications on because the text on the nameplate got wiped off? Like really? You couldn't use an oil-resistant ink? And who wants a 40 millimeter pulley with a non-standard keyway? I just ate the cost of these components because I'm performing this conversion to learn and because I enjoy it. CNC milling is a great hobby for keeping you sharp. Okay, I'm stepping off the box. To drive the second pulley by the first pulley, we need a new belt because not only is the pitch different, but also these two pulleys collectively are larger than the stock pulleys. The old belt won't even fit around them. To determine the new belt length, you need to know the distance between the two pulleys, which I measured to be about 162 millimeters before I took everything apart. I plugged that value and the 92 millimeter diameter of both pulleys in a belt length calculator, which gave me a 613 belt length. Closed loop belts come in fixed sizes and the closest length I could find on McMaster was a 640 millimeter belt. Now this is quite a bit larger than what I needed, which is why I had to make the slots on the feet so long. This belt is a Gates Polychain GT with carbon fiber reinforcement. A very stiff belt with little, if any, belt stretch. I'm now going to attach the pulleys and put everything together on the machine. So I do want to point out there's a small amount of backlash between the pulley and the spline shaft. You can hear it clicking before it starts to turn. This will be important later for when we add that encoder that's going to actually track how the spindle is moving. That thing is heavy. <laughs> okay. Should we do a couple more times for the B-roll? <laughs> <laughs> 
I went ahead and hooked up the new motor to the stock variable frequency drive or VFD which controls the motor speed. More on this later. I had to pay careful attention to the wiring diagram that came with the motor because you can wire it for low voltage operation at 230 volts or high voltage operation at 460 volts. I swing around to the other side you may have noticed these two extra wires that are hanging loose here and these allow for a microcontroller to sense the temperature of the motor which can then be used to shut the motor down if it overheats. This is a great safety feature which we will be using later on. If I switch the VFD on, we get rotation. Because an inverter duty motor doesn't require a shaft mounted fan, this motor is even quieter than the last one. Let's crank it up a little bit. Fantastic. The next step is to give Linux CNC control over the VFD so that it can synchronize the rotation of the spindle with the Z-axis feed rate. In theory, we could probably get this stock VFD to communicate with Linux CNC by switching out this analog potentiometer with the digital one that is present on the Mesa board, which is inside this cabinet. But I suspect this to be an uphill battle. I checked the stock VFD before I took off the old motor and there were some accuracy problems. Check out my findings. So I've always been a little worried about the accuracy of this digital RPM readout that came with the mill. I went out and purchased this laser photo contact tachometer in order to get a second opinion on the matter. I stuck a piece of reflective tape on the collet and I'm going to compare the value from this guy with the digital readout on the mill. So we're going to start at the minimum RPM, which is 50. And the digital tachometer says 43.8, 43.4. You know, that's about a 12 to 14% error. Not ideal, but that could be because we're at the low end of the RPM. Let's go ahead and increase it to 1,000. Eight hundred eighty one still about a twelve percent error. So twelve percent error is pretty bad, but I could probably compensate for it on the software side of things. However, I couldn't find any data sheets or even a manufacturer for this stock VFD, so it's difficult for me to tell how it's controlling the motor or if it's even appropriately sized. These unknowns led me to ditch this VFD. At this point, if you're not familiar with AC motors, then you probably have some questions like, how does a VFD control the speed of a motor? Are there different methods? How precise do we need to control this speed for rigid tapping? And perhaps we should even ask, what is the maximum and minimum speeds of a three-phase motor? Admittedly, I'm more of a DC motor guy, but I will talk through some of the macro details of AC motor control in this video and I will have a write-up on my website for the smaller details and any corrections for this video if needed. This new Marathon motor and the old stock motor require three-phase power. Three-phase power is found at most commercial businesses because it's the most efficient way to run large electrical devices such as motors. Most residential addresses do not have access to three-phase power. But let's pretend that I do and could plug this motor directly into the wall. How fast would the motor spin if there was no VFD between the motor and the power source? Well, we can calculate that speed through the following equation. 120 times the frequency of the power divided by the number of poles in the motor. In the United States, the frequency of AC power is 60 Hertz. So we can insert 60 into the equation and four, which is the number of poles in this motor. You can find that info on the nameplate. This equation outputs a shaft rotational speed and for our parameters, we get 1800 RPM. So if we hooked up our motor to a three phase outlet, it should spin at 1800 RPM. But this assumes that the shaft rotates as fast as the magnetic field changes, which is known as synchronous speed. But in reality, the shaft of an inductive motor actually lags slightly behind. The amount of lag is known as the slip. 
Looking at the faceplate on the motor, it says the base motor speed is 1750 RPM. This is 50 RPM less than what our equation calculated, so our slip is 50 RPM. Now the slip is not important for what we're trying to accomplish today, but that shaft speed equation is because it tells us how to change the speed of the motor. This is accomplished through changing the frequency of the three phase power. So at a very simple level, a VFD converts single phase power into something that looks like three phase power to the motor, and it can change the frequency of said pseudo three phase power to get many different frequencies and thus speeds of the motor. Unfortunately for the VFD, it's not as easy as just changing the frequency of the alternating current to get the motor to go slower or faster. The hang up is that different frequencies can result in changes to the magnetic flux of the motor. This leads us to the voltage per frequency ratio. Again, if we had access to 230 volt, three phase power at my house in the United States, the voltage to frequency ratio would be 230 volts divided by 60 hertz, which equals 3.83 volts per hertz. This ratio is proportional to the magnetic flux inside the motor. Therefore, if you decrease the frequency while the supplied voltage remains constant, your magnetic flux would increase. If the magnetic flux increases too much, then the motor will overheat. The inverse is also not ideal. If you increase the frequency to speed up the motor, then the flux will decrease, leading to a loss of torque. To solve this problem, the voltage must also be varied to maintain the optimal voltage per frequency ratio. This is the approach taken by VFDs that use the scalar method, which is often referred to as the voltage per hertz method. The problem with this method is that it's not capable of precise speed control and reacting to different load conditions. Like what if we put in different size taps within the mill? That M10 tap requires much more force than M5. Consequently, this type of control is often used for industrial fans and pumps where a range of speeds are acceptable. However, such a VFD would not work for my rigid tapping upgrade where we need precise control over the shaft. Vector control is far more complicated than scalar control, so I will drop some links in the description to help you understand this technology. But from a high level view, vector control uses current feedback from the motor as well as an algorithm to find the best output voltage to run the motor. Vector control isn't just trying to maintain that volts per hertz ratio. Automation Direct offers a lot of different VFDs, which can be overwhelming if you don't know what you're looking for. But I'm going to step you through my decision making process. After clicking on the VFD category, there are four subcategories of drives, general purpose, micro, high performance, and NEMA 4X. The NEMA 4X drives are for harsh conditions, which is not something we need or we'll talk about. The other three categories are here right in front of me. This is a micro WE drive. This is the general purpose GS20 drive. And these two guys are the high performance GS4 drives. I've been reading about the capabilities of these drives for the past couple of weeks, and man, I've only scratched the surface. There's so much more than just a variable frequency drive. They contain internal logic controllers that allow them to respond to external signals without being connected to a computer or microcontroller. This is useful in a number of applications, like if you need an exhaust fan to increase its speed when a temperature reaches a certain point, or a pump to decrease its speed to maintain a constant pressure the drives will directly interface with that pressure or temperature sensor. No need for an external device. Anyways, there's just simply too much to go over in this video, and I plan to make more content on these drives outside of the context of milling, so get subscribed if you wanna be notified when I release those videos. I am gonna focus on the general purpose drives because for one, these drives are very affordable, and two, they're much more advanced than the category general purpose lets on. The GS20 drives have the most up-to-date features, so I will shop those units. From here, I narrowed down the results by selecting two horsepower, the power rating of my motor, and single phase power input. That leaves us with the GS21 22P0. Unfortunately, it's out of stock for this walkthrough, but I'm assured that'll be back soon. Now just matching the horsepower rating of the drive to the motor is not enough. We need to make sure the drive can handle the full load amperage, or FLA, of our motor, which is 6 amps at 230 volts. The drive can support up to 7.5 amps for constant duty, so it looks like we're in the clear.
I took off the stock VFD and then off camera I went ahead and mounted the new drive to the wall and took care of some wire management. Now this drive is so small I could have mounted it in the same location as the old VFD but I eventually plan to enclose this mill and possibly run flood coolant so I thought it best just to pull the drive out for now. Also with this mounting location I can quickly test some of the other drives that Automation Direct sent out to see how they compare. If we take a quick look at the wire management, I'm running two new drag chains. The one on your left will be for the high voltage motor cable, while the one on the right will be for low voltage signals like the one coming from the encoder. Of course, the encoder will be used to track the location of the spindle. I also stuck the power drawbar air lines into the drag chain as well, just to keep everything tidy. I'm hoping that keeping these low voltage signal wires separate from the motor wires will be enough to prevent EMI from distorting the signal. I will revisit the setup if electrical noise becomes a problem. If we refocus on the VFD, you can see that I have the input wired to 220 volt single phase, the output connected to a four conductor cable that supplies power to the motor. That fourth conductor is a ground, which is a must to protect myself and the machine. Now you can also see that this silver component down here is also connected and this is a braking resistor which helps decrease deacceleration times. We'll talk about this more in a bit. Before I wire the VFD to the microcontroller in the cabinet that controls the mill, I want to hook up this analog potentiometer and forward and reverse switch from the old VFD to the new one just to make sure everything works. The microcontroller is basically a digital version of these components and should operate as expected if everything checks out here. With the potentiometer, you have three connections, one for the voltage supply, a common, and an output. With VFDs, the supply voltage is usually 10 volts, which means that the output of the potentiometer will vary from zero to 10 volts. The higher the voltage, the faster the motor will spin. This forward and reverse switch is just two normally open switches tied to a knob. This wiring is based off the quick start guide that comes with the drive. These spring terminals make it super easy to insert and switch wires around. Before we start cranking up the speed, we need to configure this drive to match the characteristics of my motor so that we don't do any damage to the motor or spindle. If you've never set up a VFD before, then you'll probably be overwhelmed by the sheer number of parameters that can be changed to tailor your drive to your specific needs. Fortunately, these GS20 series drives include a profile for when they're used in a CNC mill or lathe setup, which greatly simplifies this process. But before we activate that profile, we need to set three parameters that are motor specific, max output voltage, rated amps, and max output frequency. My max output voltage is 220 volts, and the motor rated amps is six. The max output frequency will dictate how fast the motor will spin. Recall from our calculation earlier that at base frequency of 60 hertz, this motor spins at 1750 RPM. The motor can be pushed to higher speeds by increasing the frequency, but you do lose some torque. This drive is capable of outputting 600 hertz, which would result in the motor spinning 10 times its base speed. However, the faceplate says that the max safe RPM of this motor is 5400, which would mean that the drive should not put out more than 180 hertz. I'm going to further limit the speed for now because I'm not sure what the stock spindle bearings are rated to spin at. Prior to this upgrade, the max speed of the mill was 3200 RPM, so I'm going to limit the drive to 120 hertz to be in that ballpark. I picked up some new SKF bearings that I will install in an upcoming video that can handle the max safe RPM of this motor. Now after those parameters are set, the drive can't damage the motor or spin up to a speed that burns up the spindle bearings. But it's not yet optimized to control this specific inverter duty motor. This is accomplished by running the auto-tune program, which will allow the VFD to measure the stator resistance and no load current. To do this properly, you need to remove the load from the motor prior to doing the auto-tuning, so I took off the belt. 
A couple minutes later and the drive is ready to run this specific motor. From here, we just need to activate that machine tool profile, which will set the rest of the parameters for us. This configures the drive to accept the analog signal from the potentiometer, as well as the signal from the forward reverse switch. I have the display set up to read the potentiometer value in a percent form, with zero being zero volts and 100% being 10 volts and the maximum speed of the motor. If I turn this switch to have the spindle turn in the clockwise direction, we have it in run mode. From here, the potentiometer is reading zero, we can increase this value to get rotations. It's about 15% of the maximum speed. Fifty percent. One hundred percent. Now right now we're at about 500 RPM. And what I want to show you is how quickly we can switch directions of this spindle. Clockwise. Counterclockwise. Clockwise. Counterclockwise. The motor is able to stop in reverse direction so quickly due to the braking resistor. When the VFD slows down the motor, it turns into a generator and that extra current is diverted into the braking resistor. Without an appropriately sized braking resistor, the drive will shut down due to an overload of current. A braking resistor is absolutely necessary for rigid tapping where quick decelerations are needed to switch the direction of the tap on the way out. The recommended braking resistor for the GS2122P0 drive was listed on the Automation Direct website. Now that we've proven that the VFD is operating as it should, it's time to connect it to my Mesa 7i76E microcontroller. The bad news is that I have to use the analog input to control the VFD, just as the potentiometer did. The problem with this is that I can't get feedback from the drive, like what load the motor is under, with this analog output. It's a one-way communication. The VFD also communicates over a protocol known as Modbus, which can transmit variables such as spindle load. It just doesn't work with my Mesa 7i76E. There are some hacks to get it to work, but they add a significant delay, which messes up the synchronous motion that is needed for rigid tapping. I am gonna look into this further though. Don't think that the microcontroller is going to be blindly controlling the motor. It will be receiving rotational feedback through this encoder. Finding a way to sync the encoder with the rotation of the spindle was perhaps the trickiest part of this upgrade. Typically, you just couple the encoder to the end of a shaft, to a coupler. But in my setup, my power drawbar sits at the top of the spindle, so that's not an option. My first idea was to slip in a low profile pulley between this big pulley that drives the spindle and this nut. But as I pointed out earlier, there's a surprisingly high amount of backlash between this pulley and the spline shaft. Now the spline shaft is what actually is connected to the rotating tool and I don't want to have to account for that degree or so of backlash on the encoder side. So my next plan was to get a custom pulley made that would fit over the spline shaft, but to get that complex geometry machined into a pulley was really expensive. After asking for some help over on my form, Todd Candy, an awesome form member, was like, why don't you just print a pulley with your fancy SLS printer? And I can't believe I didn't think of that idea. So I went over to McMaster Car, downloaded the step file for a GT260 tooth pulley from there, and then cut a profile in it to accept the spline shaft. If you haven't seen my most recent video on selective laser centering, then definitely check out that video on this really unique form of additive manufacturing that's perfect for printing uh, these unique pulleys. I had the part in my hand later that afternoon. And let me tell you, I'm super impressed with the results. The GT2 belt fits nicely between the teeth. It's made out of nylon, so I have high hopes for the longevity of this component, and it's really not taking any kind of load. It just needs to spin the encoder shaft 
which moves freely. So I'll take off the cylinder and I'll slide on my printed pulley. Wow, it fits nicely on the spline shaft, no play whatsoever. I printed this part as well to hold the encoder uh, with some slots that will allow me to adjust the belt tension. The encoder will sit off to the side so it doesn't interfere with my power drawbar. From my understanding, this is not the best way to drive an encoder because the belt will tug on the encoder shaft. There are ways to support the shaft so this doesn't happen, but in my initial testing, it looks like this is gonna work. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stick the power drawbar back on. It should fit on either side of the encoder, and it does. I'm gonna wire everything back up. I'm gonna make sure that the code is communicating correctly with the encoder and the VFD. I didn't wanna make this a super heavy Linux CNC video, so if you are interested in that route, definitely check out my website where there will be code, wiring diagrams, everything you need to do to get from this point right here in the video to the next point, which will be some rigid tapping. For testing, I picked up a couple blocks of machinable wax. This stuff is great for trying out new G-code because if the tool accidentally plunges into the material, it's not going to break. Further, machinable wax doesn't hide mistakes. If the tap doesn't reverse perfectly at the bottom of the hole, it will rip up all of the previous threads. In Linux CNC, the G-code G33 is for spindle synchronized motion and G33.1 is specifically for rigid tapping. A typical rigid tapping example starts off with setting the spindle speed with an M3 command, and then once the spindle is located above the hole, calling a G33.1 with a Z and K parameter. Z is how far down you want to tap, and K is the Z distance moved for each rotation of the spindle. K will always be equal to the pitch of your bolt. And that's it. The mill will drop down, spin clockwise into the hole, reverse, and back all the way out with that single line of G-code. This simplicity is probably why I was successful with my first ever rigid tapping cycle. I am tapping these holes with a M5 0.8 millimeter pitch tap at a depth of 20 millimeters. So the G-code is G33.1, Z minus 20, K 0.8. It's incredibly satisfying to watch as the spindle slows down, reverses, and comes right back out the way it went in. For these last five holes, I increased the RPM of the motor by 100 for each hole, starting at 500 and ending at 1000. The main limitation to rigid tapping is the Z-axis speed. If the Z-axis can't keep up with the spindle, the Linux CNC is going to throw a fault. Besides raw speeds, acceleration and deacceleration of the Z-axis is also important. As you saw in the manual potentiometer example, the VFD can almost instantaneously start, stop, and change directions of the motor. The Z-axis, which has by far the most inertia of any of the three axes, can definitely not do that. When I configured the VFD with that machine tool profile, it actually limited the acceleration and deacceleration of the drive to five seconds, which would be how long it takes for the motor to go from resting to its max speed. I ended up bumping this down to three seconds because my Z-axis could handle it. What I found interesting was that you don't have to put the motor acceleration parameters into the configuration file for the mill. I had thought that surely the mill would need to know this information so that the Z-axis slows down and speeds up at the right time. But what I found out later is that when you call that G33 command, the Z-axis becomes tied with the output of the encoder and mirrors the speed, acceleration, and deacceleration of the encoder, which of course is tied to the spindle. I hope it is now clear why it's important that that encoder is directly tied to the motion of the tool and any discrepancies like backlash will affect the tapping cycle. Next, I'm going to make some larger threads with this M8 1.25 millimeter tap. M8 threads will probably be about as big as I go with rigid tapping on this mill. While beefy, this spindle motor is still two horsepower 
And as I discussed previously, the amount of torque required for progressively larger taps grows exponentially, not linearly. For larger holes, I'll just use thread milling. I'm just using a normal ER20 collet to hold the tap. There are some special tap holders that have a small amount of float, similar to that tension compression head, that can soak up any discrepancy between the spindle and the Z-axis. However, I find those holders to be unnecessary if the spindle and the Z-axis are appropriately synced. You do want to pick a collet that's closest to the diameter of your tap. You don't want it to collapse a far distance because then you're going to have a higher chance of it slipping. Man, those M8 threads turned out super crisp. Let's talk a little more about the encoder before we start tapping some aluminum. The encoder is a Koyo TRD S2000 VD. It's an incremental encoder that sends 2000 pulses per rotation of its shaft to the microcontroller. The rate at which these pulses come in are what are translated to spindle speeds. The pulley that drives the encoder is the same size as the one on the spline shaft, so the encoder and shaft spin at the same rates. Let's quickly talk about taps. There are a lot of different types of taps, but I have two favorites. This is a straight flute, and this is a spiral flute tap. This straight flute tap is also known as a chip clearing tap because as it cuts the thread, it pushes the chips in front of the tap, so this should only be used for through holes. The spiral flute manages the chips in the opposite direction, pulling them towards the tap and out of the hole. The spiral flute is great for blind or closed end holes. Let's use both these tools in some 6061 aluminum. The material is about 25 millimeters or an inch thick, and I plan to drill four through holes in the center and four blind holes in each of the corners to show off those two different taps. These will be M8 threads. Notice how the chips are pushed out of the hole for the straight flute tap. The spiral flute pulls those chips out the way it comes in, which is a must because there's no room at the bottom of that closed end hole. Just as we saw with the machinable wax, we also get some really nice threads in aluminum. It didn't seem like the motor was having any trouble at all. These holes were tapped at 500 RPM. The main benefit of rigid tapping is the speed at which it can be accomplished. Let's see how long it takes to tap 50 M5 holes in 13mm or half inch material. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that speed speaks for itself. If you're making production parts with threaded holes, then the productivity increases that rigid tapping enables are definitely worth pursuing. And that about wraps up this video. If you enjoyed it and want to see more CNC mill upgrades, then let me know by hitting that like button. I'm thinking that the next upgrade will be an enclosure, but that could take a little time to put together, so I may sneak another video in between. Either way, keep up to date with my work on this mill and other projects by following me on Instagram. One final thanks to the video sponsor, Automation Direct, who made this video possible. Links for all the products that were used during this upgrade are in the description. And I will catch you guys in the next one.